Buenos dias, mis amigos. Alright, so first of all, I'm going to start off by recommending this video by Truth is Christ. And the information that he puts in here is amazing. I'm not a big numbers guy, but the information that he provides is rather incredible and if anybody's interested go check this guy out the video he put out 20 hours ago all right and of course I know this stuff here uh, first and last verse of the Bible in Genesis 1 verse 1 and Revelation 22 verse 21 it's got 44 letters 17 vowels, 27 consonants, whatever that word is. All right, and so also in the very last verse of the Bible. Now, that by itself is pretty incredible, but he goes even further with this bit of information, and it's incredible. That's all I can say. So check it out if you got if you if you're interested, okay? So what I want to get into is a video by Good News in a Dark World 19 hours ago All right, and um, just looking over uh, some of this here in the description so uh, let's listen to what he has to say and then we'll just uh, get into why he's wrong <laughs> I mean it's un it's unbelievable really it's remarkable how every single preacher teaches Revelation 20 incorrectly it is it's just one after another uh oh, what happened here? Well, when I pulled up this video, it was right after this one. <laughs> and now it's gone. But I still got it here. Uh, so let's listen. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and so, bound him for a thousand... Right, so the very first thing that stands out to me is this guy uh, doesn't believe in any Bible at all. He doesn't believe the Bible that he holds in his hand. He doesn't believe in any Bible whatsoever. And this is evidence that, uh, you know... Whenever these guys they quote from a corrupt Bible, they don't believe the Bible they corrupt. They uh, they preach from, uh, and they'll always point to foreign languages. When foreign languages is not the Word of God. <laughs> Again, if you have questions, you know this stuff right here might open your eyes. Really, uh, the Bible itself ought to open your eyes, but it all begins with faith. Now we can do this here. Read all English translations of Revelation 20. And we see the word... Oh, wait a second. That's not it. We see the word ancient mentioned there. What am I doing? Oh, my bad. I apologize. See, this is evidence that I need to read the Bible even more myself, right? Alright, so we'll go to Revelation 20, verse 2. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Now this fellow here, when he says ancient serpent, I know that this guy is a deceiver. And he's not intentionally being a deceiver. He's been deceived himself. Alright, and we see here, let's do it this way now. Alright, so we oops. So we see all these mentions of ancient serpent. Uh, the complete Jewish Bible. The Darby. Alright, the ESV. 
right? The, all the big named corrupt Bible versions. The LEB, the NIV, right there we go. Uh, if I had to guess, that's probably he sees the dragon. He, and he sees the dragon. No, that's not it. So let's find let's find what version he's using. And he seized. I doubt the DLN. There, there it is. The ESV. I can almost guarantee you that's what he's reading from, right? The ESV. I think of that as the second most popular corrupt Bible version. Of course, the RSV also says. And he sees the dragon. Of course, the RSV is the revised standard version, and it is uh, popular among uh, Catholics. Right? Oops. Uh, and, you know, I would contend that the Catholics are responsible for all the corrupt Bible versions because all you have to do is go back and look the history of the King James Bible and when King James commissioned 54 of the greatest scholars of that time to translate the Bible into the English language and who came after King James that was the Catholic Church and even today, remember, remember, the 5th of November. And so on and so forth. Alright, so the bottom line is this guy doesn't believe the words that he's even saying. Doesn't believe in any Bible at all. So that's number one right there. Thousand years and threw him into the pit. Now, of course, if you don't believe the Bible that you hold in your hands, how can you expect to have any understanding at all? and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also wait, 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 wait. Is that what is that what the ESV says? Hold on a second, I gotta check this out. How's he word that? Authority to judge committed. Authority was committed. Yeah, it's still the ESV. Yep. In fact, it, that narrows it down to only the ESV. Boy, that's worded so goofy, man. It's worded so goofy, it's no wonder so many people don't understand it. So I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or on their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for th okay. a thousand Hold years. On the rest of the dead... No, this is on obvious here. To me, it's just obvious. This guy has absolutely no understanding, so he's going to quote the entire The Lake of Fire day Listen. and night forever and ever. Several weeks ago, when we were in chapter 12, I mentioned to you that the longest war in history was known as the Reconquista. Alright, so obviously, to me, this is clear as day. Uh, beautiful plants here. He's he's probably was preaching to a hundred people, maybe more. He's got the nice suit, and um, people look up to him. And it's interesting. He reads the entire chapter of Revelation 20, and the first thing he says when he's finished to you that the longest war in history was known as the Reconquista. Talks about something absolutely irrelevant, irrelevant to Revelation 
chapter 20. In other words, he has no understanding at all. I mean, really. Let's clarify something here that is indisputable. That you ought to be able to see for yourself. And that's in Revelation 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. Arguably the most important verse in the entire chapter of Revelation 20. Arguably the most important because this here solidifies the fact that we are saved by grace through faith. And we are saved right now by grace through faith. We're not going to be saved in the future. We are saved right now. We are saved, sealed, secured, sanctified forever. And just to uh, get a verse here that supports that. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. The day of redemption is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. And <laughs> this is what Revelation 20 is about. Verse 11 is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. All right. The thousand years are, the end of the thousand years are, is the end of the world. And at the end of the world, our enemy is gathered at our feet. When our enemy is gathered at our feet, that's when we're up in the air with the Lord. All right. It's pretty simple stuff because it's repeated over and over all throughout the Bible. Let's go to a parable in Matthew 13 of the wheat and the tares. You can't get around this stuff, man. Let's go to uh, verse 30. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Alright, so the wheat, now the harvest is the end of the world, alright? The wheat is those of us that are saved, the tares are the unsaved. Alright, make uh, the harvest is the end of the world, man. And we so we got a parallel here. What happens first? The enemy is gathered at our feet, and fire comes down from God and burns them. Bind them in bundles to burn them, and fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them all. It's the same thing. It's it's a fulfillment of what we read in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 when the Lord says to the serpent I will put enmity between thee and the woman between thy seed and her seed and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel that's so simple so important to understand because uh, we get this all throughout the Bible in Psalm 110 until uh, I make thine enemies thy footstool. And there's numerous other places. But let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. And we read here in verse 25. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. We're getting a parallel here. All right. So this is the end of the world. Now in verse 4. And I saw thrones. And they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. When we are born of the Spirit of God, Jesus abides in us, and we abide in Him, and we shall never die. All right. The water that Jesus gives us is a well of water springing up. into everlasting life. John 4 verse 14 But whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never 
thirst. Why? Because judgment has already been given to us. Because we are born of the Spirit of God. We are born of God. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Everlasting life. Everlasting life. That means judgment has already been given to us. Of course, in John chapter 3, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Being born of water is being born from your mother's womb. All right, when the water breaks, the baby follows. All right, and but he, okay, so in verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. This is a parallel to a man being born of water. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. So when we are born again, we are born of the spirit of God. We are born of God. We can not be unborn ever. When we are born of God, we have the spirit of God in us and we shall never die. We have everlasting life therefore the judgment of God is eternal life for those that are born of God judgment has been given to us already and I saw thrones and they that sat upon them we are right now those of us that are born of God we are kings and priests unto God right now Revelation chapter 1 verse 6 and has made us kings and priests unto God and his father right now we are kings and priests right now now there's no way to get around this even in Exodus 19 verse 6 it says and ye shall be unto me now this is the Lord speaking to Moses the Lord says, And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. They were a kingdom of priests. Right now we are a kingdom of priests. We are a kingdom of priests. We are kings and priests unto God and his Father. Right, in first Peter chapter two verse nine says, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Right now we are kings and priests. We are a royal priesthood, we are kings and priests unto God. Right now we sit on thrones, on heavenly thrones. We are kings and priests unto God and His Father right now. Right now we sit on thrones. We that are born of God right now sit on thrones. Right now the judgment of God has been given to us right now. And the judgment is eternal life that can never change. We are sealed, secured, sanctified, saved forever. All right, arguably the most important verse in the entire chapter of Revelation 20 because if you don't got that if you don't got that right how can you understand any of it really okay and so um, sort of working backwards real quick ah, let me just throw a thought at you and then I'll just end it there You've heard me call this, uh, you know, these people, they teach a zombie doctrine. Um, 
and it's it's not just one of them it's all of them all of these guys every single one of them it's incredible they all got it wrong absolutely incredible the millennial reign anybody teaching and this stuff is stupid it's incredible how stupid these guys are and it's I'm telling you it's because they don't have faith in the Word of God it's incredible because they lack faith they lack understanding all right so uh, if you don't understand this man you're not gonna understand any of it but the zombie doctrine which is the doctrine that all these people teach okay is this idea that there will be a thousand year period coming after Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven not supported not supported by scripture at all anywhere but during this thousand years there will be people without their heads okay they will be headless according to the scripture and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years people without heads living and reigning with Christ a thousand years that's I mean how do you get around how do you get around that really if you're gonna say that there's a thousand year period coming after Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven then you also have to say that there are people walking around without heads during this thousand years and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. headless people living and reigning with Christ for a thousand years uh, that's what you're teaching man it, to imagine your scenario you can't get around there you're saying these people are living that's what you're saying <laughs> just admit it man just be honest you're saying headless people are living with Christ and it's just ridiculous all right so you gotta ignore that verse you gotta ignore um, verse 4 all right you got to ignore the fact that Jesus Christ is the first resurrection I mean you got to go all out and say everything's a lie to teach this doctrine and that's why it burns me it burns my butt because they get every single thing wrong every single thing wrong Jesus is the first resurrection we are partakers of his resurrection to teach anything different is to teach an unholy doctrine There shouldn't be any doubt about this. You read you read this multiple times all throughout the Bible, how Jesus died and defeated death and rose back to life. He's the first resurrection. He resurrected and ascended to heaven and has promised to return for us. This is all throughout the Bible. And now you get to Revelation 20 and you're going to ignore it? And now you're going to say, oh, Jesus is no longer the first resurrection. You're ignoring it, willfully ignoring the fact that Jesus Christ died and defeated death. I mean, really, it's almost like, you know, there are Jewish people teaching these things because they reject the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you teach this idea that Jesus is not the first resurrection, you are rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ it clearly all throughout the Bible we know that Jesus Christ is the first fruits of them that slept all right let's go let's go back over here what, what verse am I looking for here is it right here well oh, right there it is I'm sorry verse 20 but now is Christ risen from the dead from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. 
Jesus Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection. That means he's the first resurrection. What, you? that's too complicated for you? You can't understand that? Or is it just that this conflicts with your zombie doctrine of headless people running around and having sex for a thousand years after the Lord Jesus Christ comes in the clouds? It conflicts with what you're watching on the on TV, it doesn't it? When you see Nicolas Cage up there and he's, you know, doing his thing, you want to believe him, but you won't believe the Bible that you hold in your hands. It's, it's incredible. Why? Why would you believe Nicolas Cage and not the Word of God? Why? Just because you you like seeing what you're, you know, you like what you're seeing on TV. I mean, Nick, you, Nicholas Cage, good-looking guy. He's a, he's a you know rugged, masculine kind of fella, right? I mean, I mean, come on, man. What is it? What is it that is driving so many people to reject? the Word of God and to believe what they're seeing on TV well you know again this is uh, prophesied all throughout the Bible as well isn't it now you think about Matthew 24 in verse uh, 3 Jesus is asked what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world and in verse 4 and 5 the very first thing that Jesus says Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I, Jesus, am Christ, and shall deceive many. And, I mean, this is all throughout the Bible, but uh, another example would be for our Second Timothy 3. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, if you would have understood... Matthew 24 you would have understood that already right because Jesus is laying it all out for us how the world is going to grow in deception and then Jesus will come in the clouds of heaven the signs of the end time is deception and this is all throughout Matthew 24 Mark 13 Luke 21, it's all about deceivers. It's not about wars. It's not about famines and pestilences and earthquakes. It's about deceptions. In fact, it clearly, simply, plainly states that it's not about wars, earthquakes, pestilences, and that sort of stuff. It's clearly about deception and the deceivers and um, you know you shall hear of wars commotions be not terrified for these things must first come to pass but the end is not by and by it's not about those things it's not about those things at all it's about the deception and the hatred and the wickedness of the world it's all about deceptions the, the deceivers that's the sign of the end of the world and it's interesting um, that we uh, uh, read in Luke chapter 18 I tell you that he will avenge them speedily nevertheless when the Son of Man cometh shall he find faith on earth alright so God will avenge his own elect which cry out day and night unto him though he bear long with them this is a amazing question to ask shall he find faith on earth this is indicative that when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven there will be very few people saved 
When God destroyed the world by water, there were only eight souls saved. In Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about, there wasn't even ten righteous. So also when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, will he find faith on earth? Now we know that for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. For if he would not shortened those days, there should no flesh be saved. So we're progressing and progressing to a uh, world where there's nobody saved at all. If God were to let things carry out for all eternity, there would be absolutely nobody saved at all. But God will come and shorten these days before we progress to that point in this world. So, how can that happen? Yeah, killing all the Christians, that ain't going to matter. Because the truth will still be out there, right? It's not about killing people. If the truth is still out there, people are going to find it. Now, the only way that they can achieve this, the only way the world, I should say, can achieve this, is by confusing the truth and by deceiving people. That's the only way. So it's the deception that we're seeing in the world which is the sign that the end is near. The deception is greater than it's ever been and it's only getting worse. The deception in the world today is worse than what it was in the days of Noah. The deception in the world today is worse than it'll ever be and it's only getting worse. All right, and then God's going to cut off those days. So it's interesting when we see people teaching Revelation 20, and they are teaching that Jesus is not the first resurrection. That reveals their heart. That's revealing that they have a wicked heart, a, de a heart full of deception, right? Because they don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. How can you say you believe in Jesus Christ, but you don't believe he's the first resurrection? What, are you the first resurrection? Is somebody else, another God, perhaps? Are they the first resurrection? Well, what are you teaching here? What are you teaching? Are you teaching people with their heads cut off? Are you teaching the zombies are the first resurrection? People run around with their heads cut off. That's who you believe is the Lord God Almighty. Headless zombies. You believe headless zombies are the first resurrection. And then you'll be resurrected after them. So you're going to follow headless zombies. Headless zombies are leading the way for you. And you, don't, you don't see this? I think the whole world's gone mad. I really do, because it's not one person. It's not a couple of people. It's every single preacher on YouTube teaching the same doctrine of zombies. Every single one of them. Look at them. Every single one. And think of all the... It's not just... You don't just don't think about all the preachers, but think of all the people that they're preaching to. It's amazing. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded, and they lived and reigned with Christ, the zombies running around the world, reigning with Christ. They don't have a head. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years finished. The zombies are the first resurrection. You see what I'm getting at, right? I mean, 
these guys are are mad they're crazy and this stuff should be simple really we are kings and priests right now right now we are a royal priesthood right now we are called to preach the gospel to every creature right now we are kings and priests unto God and his father right now right and people have been getting their heads cut off for being a witness of Jesus for quite a while it's even in the you know even John the Baptist he got his head cut off and he's going to be resurrected and ascend into heaven the same time that we are whether we're in the grave or whether we're still alive and remain we will be caught up together with John the Baptist in the air to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord every man in his own order Christ the first fruits afterward they that are Christ that is coming so John the Baptist he's gonna be saved he's gonna be resurrected when Jesus Christ comes in the clouds of heaven just like me and you right for he must reign till he's put all enemies under his feet the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years are finished so at the end of the thousand years it's the end of the world and this has been prophesied all throughout the Bible all throughout the Bible Daniel 12 verse 2 and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt it's the end of the world folks this is what happens at the end of the world and you can't get around it this is zombie doctrine that everybody's teaching it doesn't work Jesus Christ is the first resurrection and we that are born of God are partakers of his resurrection and at the end of the thousand years when he comes in the clouds of heaven we will be lifted up to meet the Lord in the air so shall we ever be with the Lord I know people have so much confusion because they're listening to people that have no idea what they're talking about. Satan is bound right now, but Jesus Christ bound Satan. So when he bound Satan, he made the kingdom of God available to whosoever believes in him. You know, let's go use uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 as an example to teach this. All right, so before baby Jesus came, there was one nation of God, and the kingdom of God was within that one nation, the nation of Israel. All right, so you think of it as one country, all right, one country of the people of God. All right, so. Jesus comes along and he breaks down that barrier you know you think of uh, who was that Donald Trump that built a wall or wanted to build a wall I don't even know I don't even care you think of you know wall around the country you know think of uh, the, the country of God and there's a wall around the country of God now here comes Jesus and he breaks down that wall now the kingdom of God is available to whosoever believes in him right so now we that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ we are the people of God right which in time past were not a people right because we were outside of the wall but now we are the people of God because there is no wall alright so now 
there is no barrier to keep the people of God inside and then outside of the wall were the nations deceived by Satan. All right, so Satan had control over those people that were outside of the country of God. Uh, pretty simple, isn't it? Jesus comes along and he breaks the barrier, breaks the, he tears down like what Ronald Reagan said something that said that, didn't he? Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, or whatever he says. And that's it. Interesting. A powerful moment. Interesting to make that connection. Because that's exactly what Jesus did. He tore down that wall and made the kingdom of God available to whosoever believes in him. So now, Satan, Satan is bound. He's got no nations to himself. All right, because the kingdom of God is available to every nation in the world. Every country in the world has the kingdom of God available for them. All right, so now here comes Jesus again. He's coming back. He's coming in the clouds of heaven. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And when he comes in the clouds of heaven, then are we drawn up. We are lifted up to meet the Lord in the air. And when we are all the saved people are lifted up and we're in the air with the Lord Jesus, when the angels have gathered together his elect, we're up in the air. So who's left down below on the earth? It's all the unsaved people. Just like in the Old Testament, outside of the country of God, Satan had all these countries to himself. He was deceiving them all to himself. So also again in the future when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven we're lifted up and the only people on earth are the unsaved people. Satan therefore is able to deceive them once again. And what's he do? He gathers them together. Just as God has gathered us, Satan gathers the unsaved. And they compass the camp of the saints about. So uh, they are gathered at our feet. You know, just like what we read in Genesis, uh, I'm sorry, in Genesis 3 verse 15, but also, I, mean, I showed you all the verses, <laughs> a bunch of verses anyway. Genesis, uh, excuse me, Revelation 3, verse 9. I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. So, at the end of the world, when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, we are lifted up in the air. Our enemy is gathered at our feet. I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee alright so this is it that's the end of the world folks that's that's all that's it um, there's no way to get around it when our enemy is destroyed that's it you know, like we read in verse 25, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. All right, and when you know when Jesus comes, we're transformed into our glorified body, the last trump, the end of the world. We're changed into our incorruptible bodies. We are now in our immortal bodies. And when this happens. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. All right? And this is a fulfillment of everything that we've read in the entire Bible. We're changed in a moment in twinkling of an eye. Our enemy down below is gathered and destroyed. Just like what we read in Matthew 13. The parable of the wheat and the tares. The harvest is the end of the world all right and the wheat are gathered into God's barn which is up in the air 
and the tares are put in bundles and burned. And this is all throughout the Bible. All right, there's no way to get around it. When this happens, death is swallowed up in victory. There is no more death after Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. There is no thousand year period coming after Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. There is no thousand years of zombies. It's the end of the world. So therefore, all the unsaved people today, they're only opportunity to be saved is right now there will be no more opportunity for the unsaved to get saved the moment Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven it's over for them when that moment happens they know instinctively that they are doomed forever and there's nothing not a there's no warning I mean, the warning is happening right now. The warnings are happening right now. When it happens, when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, when the moment occurs, that's it. It's over. You can't you know, look up and see Jesus coming and saying, Oh, I believe now. I believe. Now it's too late. It's too late. And they're going to know it's too late. They're going to know deep in their soul that it's too late. All the tribes of the earth will mourn because they know deep down in their soul that it's too late. And men's hearts will be failing them because they know it's too late. There is no more opportunity to be saved. They know it is too late to be saved. I pointed this out yesterday. I want to point it out again. Today, it's just interesting. And it's uh, relatable, comparable. In a sense, it's a foreshadowing. That when baby Jesus was born, King Herod sent his men out to go search the star to see the savior of the world being born and the men came back they reported to Herod that we saw the child he's been born and when uh, Herod heard these things you would think hey all right the savior of the world he's born yahoo yahoo no no that didn't happen he was troubled. And not only was Herod troubled, but all of Jerusalem with him was troubled. Because they knew deep down in their soul that the judge of all judges has come. And they know deep down that the judgment that they deserve for themselves. Right? So they know. I mean, we all know deep down in our souls that the judge of all judges has come and is going to come again to execute his judgment all right, and our only opportunity to be saved is today our only hope to be saved is by the Lord Jesus Christ that little baby that was born way back when he's the one that's done it all for us he has died defeated death rose back to life and ascended to heaven and we that follow him will do the same we will die and will resurrect from the dead and will ascend up to heaven when he returns in the clouds of heaven we will be changed and transformed into our glorified body. It's only by Him that anybody can be saved. And we all know this deep down in our souls. Whether we accept it or reject it, doesn't matter. We know it deep down in our soul. Why? Because God is the one who made us. He made us this way. He made us to know 
whether we accept it or reject it, we know that the judgment of God waits.